afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thanks a lot to Bess and to Rob for inviting me as well as the um, Center for Excellence here. Uh, Rob, I'll hire you as my PR consultant, I think, going forward. That was fantastic. Um, I should uh, keep notes of that. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, bearing with me. This is a tough spot after Bill and Joe and then the third keynote speech, so I'll do my best to entertain you, keep you um, interested in what we've been doing. As Rob said, um, uh, as all of us in academia, I um, represent thoughts of many people. This is a, a snapshot of the current sustainable design lab at MIT. Um, we have a grounding in architecture, but most of us have also training in computer science, building science, and so forth. And our goal is to change current design practice, and that's of course a very um, ambitious uh, target. So the way we're doing this, we look how architects and urban planners work, look over their shoulder in the School of Planning and Architecture. And then we try to design new workflows and uh, then see if these workflows lead to better design choices. And ultimately, uh, our premise is that, um, that a more informed decision leads to a better design, ultimately. So uh, the bread and butter of what we're using are these computer-based tools that were mentioned already by the previous two speakers, uh, but the second, I guess, more in a derogative fashion, but I think uh, <laughs> have a lot of uh, value in itself. It's a 40-year-old field that is basically concerned with modeling the heat and mass flows in and around buildings, and it can be used in a variety of uh, cases. So why are we using computer-based simulation programs? Well, there are two uh, types of application. One is to demonstrate code compliance, it's similar to what you would see in a lead type project. Uh, in our group, we consider that the borrowing part. What we really want to do, we want to use them actively during the design. So it's a very simple concept, right? You come up with a design, and then you do all types of analysis on your design, and then you learn from this, and you change your design, and you have this workflow back. And if that is happening, that makes us all uh, happy. So uh, how often does that actually happen? This is a paper that we did a couple of years ago just asking a whole variety of IAC firms. So um, when you're doing simulations during the design, how often does it actually change your design? And then you see two bars here, basically the one bar where they have in-house consultants that do the energy modeling and one bar that hires the lead consultant in the end. Not surprising, if you do that at the very end, there's no time to influence design. So in 60% of the cases, the simulation doesn't change the design, which is really sad. So we thought at the time, well, at least the f in the first case, uh, the majority of um, the cases, it does influence it. But now I'm actually thinking, this is the really sad job that you have, that when you work somewhere full time and a third of your time, what you do has zero impact on your design. It's really done just for PR reasons. So ultimately, this is what we want to change, right? So. Um, what I'm going to walk you through today is basically a few main points. First of all, I want to convince you that we have this computer simulation programs that do work and that are able to predict the performance of typical buildings um, reliably during design. Then the second part is that we are actually able to teach newcomers, architects, planners to use these tools effectively and accurately. And then finally, I want to give some examples of how building performance simulation is now diffusing into architectural design, computational design, as well as into urban planning. So simple question, do today's simulation program work? And uh, ASHRAE thinks so, because they developed this ASHRAE 140 standard, which has basically a number of tests that see uh, if various aspects of the simulation tools do what other simulation tools do. Uh, when the former president of Ashway is not in the room, I tend to usually say, now who cares? Um, uh, <laughs> so, but of course, linked to all of this is Uncle Sam thinks so as well. So really, uh, due to this Ashway standard right now, if you use an Ashway 140 compliant simulation software and you show some, simulate, some energy changes during the design, then you can write that off your taxes. And that, of course, is ultimately something that feeds our whole industry. So, but these are just standards. If you just look at some measures and simulated results here, you see the first generation of lead buildings and you see on the uh, x-axis the simulated, that's a logarithmic plot, energy use during the design of the lead buildings, and then on the y-axis you see the actual <coughs> measured performance of the buildings. And so if our tools were perfect, you wouldn't see any dots, you would just see the identity line. So that's obviously not the case. There are some buildings that are doing worse. Some, especially the labs, are doing a lot worse than we thought. 
so one could now, within the context of what I'm trying to say here, say, well, these tools might not be working very accurately. Well, Ashway, of course, says there are a whole bay and bunch of input variables that we don't know, right? The actual weather, infiltration rate through the schedule of the building, that might influence how much energy the building is actually using in the end. So this is a study that uh, Holly Samuelson, when she, she did the doctorate with us, and she's speaking tomorrow as well, uh, worked in our lab. We worked with uh, Anna Modal, a Canadian company, on 20 of their buildings where they are the post-commissioning agents. And here they are employing during the first year of um, uh, occupying the building a procedure that basically takes in white, you see the triangles, uh, the simulation results during the design process. They use a commissioning procedure, a calibration method to move these over. So actually what you see right now, once we are uh, updating the results from how the building is actually being used, we get a lot closer. So as a conclusion, I would say the energy simulation models that we've developed over many, many years work reliably enough. When it comes to lighting and daylighting, there about 10 years ago, we've done a lot of studies basically in full-scale offices, look at simulations, at simulations, how close we get. So what you can remember effectively, that typically we are able, if we do everything right, to simulate lighting levels within buildings, typically with an error of about 20%. And that is really, really good because, or at least it's sufficient, because our eye itself is a logarithmic sensor. So we have a hard time saying the difference between 400 and 500 lux, and so does the computer. But this is effectively good enough. And now it comes really to the point, well, how long do the simulation programs take? And in the past, using a ray tracers such as Radiance, we have, we've had to wait for hours really to get our results. For up until about 2005, computers got a lot faster. I was never really concerned. But if you pay attention, your computer hasn't really gotten faster so much since about the last eight, nine years. What happens, you get multiple nodes, so we now need tools that can work in parallel. Uh, so in order to address this, we very recently released a new uh, replacement, if you will, for Radiance that uses the Radiance engines on a graphics card. If you want to try that, you can download that software for free from our website. It basically uses an NVIDIA card. Right now, we are about a factor of 20 to 50 faster than Radiance. But if you see the, how hardware is developing right now, we could easily be a factor of a thousand faster in two years and so forth. So that leads us ultimately to real-time daylighting renderings. So that was the first part, just giving you the background that the simulation programs that we have in principle work. Now it's of course very tricky to teach this to people that have never done any sim simulation. So uh, about uh, in 2005, 2006 was the first time I taught at McGill at the School of Architecture daylighting programs. One of the first assignments that I ever gave out was just model the daylight factor in the simple crit room using Ecotect, which is a very highly optimized tool that um, was in favor at the time. So um, I thought a student, nobody could ever possibly do that wrong. But it turned out I was wrong. So what you see here is basically the horizontal lines in the two graphs for 2005 and 2006 tell you the good result. And all the long bars tell you what the simulations from the assignments were. So either I'm a really bad teacher or I mean there were just some very basic concepts that weren't really well covered. So in order to improve that, we came up with a number of simulation checklists that you can download from our website. So what should you, what kind of mindset do you need to make reliable simulations, such as put a ground in, walls are not infinitely thin, and so forth. And what we to do today, we have a whole series of little experiments that we do to get the students towards doing reliable simulations. So starting off with, right now in the fall, in week one, they learn how to model in Rhino. In week two, this was a very popular exercise, they basically had to build an object of their choice in Rhino and in reality and just put it in the sun. And then they had to model it basically in the computer and just take a photograph to just give them a little bit of trust in their simulation results. And then we take that further so at the end they can basically model a room, take a high dynamic range photography, measurements in the space and get nearly identical results. So and when we do that then obviously if you look at the distribution on the right uh, of the daylight factor and the daylight autonomy uh, simulations of students, they get very, very close. So for daylighting, we now have a set of exercises that will teach it reliable to people how to use them. 
So what about energy? Energy is very tricky because lighting and architecture obviously go hand in hand. Everybody has a natural intuition of how much light there is in the space where the light is. Energy, you can't see it and it's not very intuitive. So in order to make it more interesting, we started playing with these games. Originally in 2011, we played this lead games in classes and when we started off, basically the students were uh, broken up in groups and had to design in 90 minutes the most efficient building that they could based on a choice of 200,000 combinations or so. And we also gave them, at the time I thought they couldn't learn to do the simulation, so we had these simulation experts sitting in the top left side and the students came with the simulation order forms and basically had to, to buy order the building. And we gave them a budget, they could spend up to eight or nine GSD dollars. And the idea was you pay for insulation, you pay for uh, lighting controls and you got money back if you made your window smaller, which was a hard one and not a lot of people did that, but uh, that would have saved you in principle. And then in the end we ran the simulation and told them how much energy that we were using. What was really great about it, here you see the 10 groups, what I liked most about the whole exercise is well, the students enjoyed it and that's always nice for an educator, but also you get very, very different results. If you look at the building at the top, they were very different and that basically shows you when you empower designers and give them simulation tools, then they don't end up having the same boring building looking south, but they can explore more and understand what matters and where they have great freedom. So now we are still playing in 2013, but we are doing everything out of Rhino. We have a new tool called Axim, which is a plugged-in multi-zone energy simulation plugin using Energy Plus that you can get from our website as well. So basically in week four, they start designing whole buildings in Rhino and run, they're running Energy Plus simulations. And um, yeah, we're going to play the full game in a couple of weeks and I'll report back how that worked. So where are we now? We have tools that work and we basically can teach people how to use them. So now how can we apply them at various levels? So the first thing that you really need when you model something is a framework, right? You have to understand, well, when I look at a building, what do I want to accomplish when it comes to energy and lighting? And the framework that we are using is this idea effectively of saying we have different concerns. We have daylight availability. Do I have any light within a space? How energy efficient am I? And what about visual comfort? And I think there's an advantage of presenting them separately, even though we know that they're interconnected. So how does this work, for example? Well, if you have too much daylight within the space, then obviously the occupants are going to react. They're going to close the blinds. If there's not enough light, they're going to turn on the light. So that has basically this feedback, which all then changes the energy inside of the building. So this is the, comp uh, the concept that Diva is, for example, based on. And uh, just give you a little bit of idea on the daylight availability part, because that recently was introduced into the new Leeds.3 version. So how, what's the question that we asked ourselves when we want daylight? Well, the tricky thing about daylight is obviously that it varies all the time. So I just can't go in a space and measure it. I have to find a way of holistically say, over the whole time when it's, the building is being used, do I have enough daylight or not? So really, I think architecturally what you want, a building anywhere, when you do a lighting simulation, you want to be able to say, well, I have enough daylight here and I have not enough daylight there. And how do you draw this line? That's effectively what we want to do. So in the past, LEED used, for example, criteria such as a 2% daylight factor. Above or below means daylight or not. We've moved on since then, so we are doing these annual calculations right now, uh, which come out of the IESNA. This is actually originally from my doctorate thesis 15 years ago. So basically what we said there, you do a simulation, you model over the whole year how much light you have every hour of the year. And then we say, what's the percentage of the time when I have enough daylight? That's effectively how it works. And so nicely after over a decade of discussions in committee that finally got without any work of mine into a standard. So I was happy when I heard about that, but at the same time I was wondering, well, how does this really uh, compare to what people think of actual spaces. And uh, typical for our field, nobody had, um, had any tests. So what we started off is this daylit area test, where we, it's a very simple assignment that we give out. We just lead uh, students before they've done any training in lighting or daylighting in a space where we know in some part is daylight and in some it's very dark, and we just ask them, draw the line, explain to us where the daylight area ends. 
So the first time we did that was at the Carpenter Center by Corbusier in, uh, in Cambridge. So this is the second floor um, studio space there, looking north. And here you see the floor plan now. And in black, you see the mean student assessment, how far the data went. And then in green, you see actually the new lead criteria, the daylight autonomy calculation. So we were all really excited because in this one space in the world it worked, right? So and then of course we wanted to expand the whole thing. So we started a project that we called the Lorax project to give architects a voice in building science and worked with uh, 13 schools of architecture pretty much scattered throughout wherever we had connections. And this is what we got here. You basically see a line of uh, based on this. So in all these schools they repeated the same uh, assignment, set us the results, and what you see on the x-axis is the simulations, what they predict, what the percentage of the data area in the study spaces are, and on the y-axis you see um, what the students' evaluations did. So overall we had a really, really good correlation there. So um, as a conclusion from this study, which is in Lucas if you're interested in, in it, um, I think there's a very um, encouraging agreement between the new lead daylighting credit and what actual uh, occupants in spaces say how much light there is. So that's good. Overall, the caveat I would say, it's surprising that this works at all. This shouldn't work at all because people have a very different perception of a space. Right? When you look in a space, you see luminances, you see light from different directions. That has nothing to do with how much light really falls on a desk. So I think ultimately we are lucky that this works in the sense it's because when you over the whole year repeat the simulations, you have this constant fall off that's ultimately a matter of the shape and form of the building. And when you uh, do the simulations often enough, you find this fall off and it just happens to coincide with people's objectives evaluation of the space. So even if we are lucky, I would take it because at least we have something that is uh, based on some research. Uh, we've done, I'm just, no, I won't have the time today. A lot of work right now is going on in our field in visual comfort. So in a way, we are able to predict pretty well how much light there is in the space. Right now, there are a whole number of groups looking at visual comfort within spaces. And again, uh, I can't get to that right now, but there's some more work on our website. So I really wanted to get to this idea if when you are, have a framework like this for simulations, then you can use various simulation tools to do the analysis. We des designed a few years ago a tool called DIVA. Uh, as Rob said, it's an uh, esoteric name, I guess inspired by the GSP. Um, so we uh, use a tool uh, that is very widely used in the uh, design world, uh, um, the rhinoceros, and what we can do out of it, we auto-generate basically energy plus and radiance models to do a whole, a whole range of analysis. And how this looks like, for example, here I show you that's the first time we applied our framework. So it's a very mundane, simple question. Imagine you have an office facing south in Boston, and you just ask yourself, should I have shadings or not? So it's architecturally as boring as it gets, but it basically brings the point across. So imagine I first run a simulation using the new lead criteria. Then if this office doesn't have any shading system, then three quarters of the office over the whole year is daylit. When I have shading, less than half of it is dated. So obviously shading seems like a bad idea. But then if you do a comfort analysis here, this is a, a visual glare map that we can generate for every hour of the year uh, when people will be feeling comfortable or not. And so the way to read this is along the x-axis is um, day of the year, and on the y-axis is time of day. So effectively in that space there, uh, any time unless it's in the summer, uh, when somebody's in the office, they're experiencing glare. The window is just too big, the screen is way too close to the window, they're not gonna be able to see anything. It's only in the summer when the sun is really high in the sky that they're not experiencing glare. So that shows you, well, it's probably a bad idea to have some blinds because blinds are something simple and reliable and they actually stop glare. Uh, but then if you look further to the right, you can do a comparison, well, how about view to the outside? So the problem is, when we have these big windows, then what's going to happen is that the blinds are down all the time, so you don't get any view either. So effectively, if you have a window with a shading system, you have a very weak wall, effectively, that, as we heard before, costs you a lot of money. So having basically a balance there is a good idea. 
And once you understand basically the amount of daylight and comfort, then it's relatively easy to convert that into energy simulation. So in this case, in Boston, with an exterior system, if you're using ca uh, carbon emissions or cost, then exterior shading, if it doesn't fall off your building, actually saves you some energy. So this was a few years ago. Now basically, we gave this framework out. We do once a year this thing we call Diva Day, where we have people coming uh, from the US and elsewhere. And we had a student competition, and it was really gratifying if you're interested in design more to see what the students came up with overall. So for example, we had last week was our Diva Day in Seattle. We had a student. What was really fantastic for us is all the submissions were by students that we've never heard of before. So it's not our own school that does all the simulations. It's were from everywhere. The winner, Salma Elama, uh, she is a Greek student from Rome. <coughs> And won the prize, uh, what the tendency that you nowadays see is basically combination of architectural design with uh, genetic algorithms. So use, she used a two-step genetic algorithm procedure where she had, uh, had inspired by a leaf, had a parametric facade that she was folding until the point when the facade was uh, giving her the most um, um, diffuse daylight distribution within a space. And then she had a second level of parametric analysis where she poked the windows in there. So it's the same framework, but more beautifully executed than the question of we, if we should use blinds or not. And another example uh, that was actually uh, our runner-up, Nibu Falma from the University of Michigan. And what I liked, she did a combination of an exterior shading system where she looked at daylighting and structural design together. So she used a plugin called Answers in, uh, for the structural analysis. So she had both running at the same time. And that, that's a really fun project as well to look at. So all of these are on the Diva website if you want to be design-wise inspired. So this is all a lot of fun. And obviously, it's taking off and making some changes. But it's not going to save the world, unfortunately. Because even if we apply shading systems to a very, very large building, we're only talking about a few percent. This is why we got more into a couple of years ago, this question of urban modeling. So what's our goal? You've all heard the statistics, urban growth in cities. So 1.6 billion new city dwellers in the next 16 years. That's the United Nations predictions. If you translate that effectively in a weekly rate, you get 2 million new uh, city dwellers every week. So it's a gigantic number, obviously. So if you use Diva to design one shading system other than the other, or the whole power of Ashway and Ibipsa together, we're not going to keep up, right? So we need tools that are affordable, that can be used by a lot of people to have a lot of impact. So in order to do that, we started and we released the first versions of our urban modeling interface. It's called UMI. And it's a simulation platform that has the goal to model whole neighborhoods and cities. And what it can do is, as you see on the screen, we can calculate operational energy use, embodied energy use, mobility, comfort, daylighting, and we have a Harvard Business School cost model in there as well. So I'll show you a little bit of how that works. But the first, uh, our first attempt to go urban was with the Cambridge Solar Map that uh, Rob mentioned. So there we really wanted to see that we can go and run radiance over a whole city. So how do you do that? Well, you use in this case, this is a photo of the MIT campus. We used LiDAR data, which the city gave us, converted that LiDAR data, which is point cloud data collected by airplanes in the radiance model with 17,000 buildings. And then we ran for every hour of the year the solar radiation on every square foot of rooftop area in Cambridge. And when you have that, you can basically translate that into a very detailed prediction of the solar photovoltaic potential uh, that every roof in the city has. So when you actually zoom in on this software that's called MapDwell, it's a company that now has done Washington DC, Boston, and a series of other cities, a spin off out of our group. You can basically go down to the building level and do an analysis of your roof. You can even draw the PV system right on your roof, and you've got all financial incentives. So it really is supposed to bring building owners and installers together. And this is a real fun study. So we did this. Um, a solar map for a place on Cape Cod called Wealthy, that some of you might know. It's a small affluent city. We released the map in April 2014, and within three months, 10% of the whole population had bought a PV system. And the statistics were really great. So basically, 
A lot of people, because we work with the Audubon Society there, uh, there was a lot of interest generated, so they all went to the map and everybody wanted a PV system. Then the installers actually siphoned out 44% of, uh, of the requests because they looked at the map and said, your roof is bad, we're not going to uh, go. So when the installers actually went in 94% of the time, they made a proposal and in over 54% of the time the homeowner accepted the proposal, which is really a fantastic way to end. Uh, so we started now our new Boston solar map and hopefully we're going to see similar results there as well. So the, the reason why we started off with photovoltaic is not because I think every roof should necessarily be covered with photovoltaic. What's the worth of a PV system on a lousy building? But when you come from the building simulation world, radiation is the easiest thing to model because you don't have to know anything about the building. So now it becomes more complicated because we want to go into the building. So uh, if you go to urbanmodeling.net, you see our new UMI tool. Uh, what it actually is, it's a plug-in again for Rhinoceros. So here you see Rhinoceros, our tool uh, floats on top of that. What you have to do is uh, you have to generate an urban massing model, either automatically or on Grasshopper or whatever you want to use for streets and trees and buildings. And then what we are doing, we auto-convert that into lead buildings for every building in your neighborhood and run an uh, energy simulation. So what can you do with that once you do that at the neighborhood scale? Well, one application is, of course, you can look in your city at the buildings that use a lot of energy and you can trust various incentive programs. So you can say, all the MERPs from the 70s, how much energy are they using, what would happen if we change the glazing there or improve the infiltration rate. And it basically gives you a way uh, to influence overall local policy decisions. Another thing that you can also do is, of course, just uh, add up the data from many, many buildings. And then you see basically uh, a mirror of the demand side of your grid. And if you comply that with a, uh, combine that with the supply side, you can decide, is it easier for us to get rid of some peaks or build buy new power plants? So we want the, a supply and demand to meet here. And how do we actually do that? Because typically people pay a lot of money for a lead building. So the way this is being done is a two-step process. The buildings have to be closed b wraps so it just means there are buckets that are completely closed that can have any shape. And then we combine them with a template editor, which is effectively um, a little can that allows us to keep any building data that is non-geometric in there. It's just a way of storing um, simulation assumptions. And then we have to take the B-Rep and combine and it transfer it into a multi-zone energy model. And that is the work of um, one of the doctorate students from our group, Timur Doga. We spent eight months on this. We call this algorithm the AutoZoner. And it works on the top left corner. This is typically the advice that Ashray gives you. So when you have a building and you multi-zone it, you uh, have basically one zone for each orientation and a core. So the AutoZoner follows Appendix G to the dot but you can even throw in a Pokemon-shaped building and it will give you an ASHRAE compliant uh, multi-zone building. Uh, so it works on anything that you can imagine. We're actually now wondering, does that make any sense? Uh, ultimately, it doesn't, because I think that's a typical phenomenon that in these standard architecture gets shortchanged. So rather than just saying, well, knowing nothing about the program and just throwing these very arbitrary rules at a building, I think we should have libraries and a lot more thoughts of what is in these buildings actually, where are the aisles, where are the usage areas, and this is something that is not being uh, asked that you consider that at all. So we can do the energy. When it comes to um, embodied energy, that's of course a topic, life cycle assessment that has long been uh, explored. Uh, in the building sector, not so much, mainly because the building sector uh, consists of these very small entities. Everybody seems to have different uh, ways of getting the materials for so doing uh, reliable embodied energy analysis means you have to redo it all the time. But it gets more important because when you look at these graphs, they show you the 20, 30 goals of various entities. So the European Union wants to reduce carbon emission by 20%, the OE in the OE buildings by 28%, and the AIA wants to have net zero energy buildings only by 2030, which is Probably not going to happen, but at least it's showing you really where the trend is. Because once you have no operational energy use, then obviously the embodied energy is everything. So uh, starting to look at that makes sense. That's uh, Carlos Cerezo from a doctorate group, 
student in our group who has an automated plugin in UMI that converts any building basically in a 50 year life cycle assessment analysis. And here you see a little example. This is uh, from a neighborhood in Cambridge called Jefferson Park. That's an um, affordable housing community built in the mid 80s and it's in pretty rough shape. So we just wanted to, with the city, have an analysis what should be done. Should we do a tabula rasa, bulldoze the whole neighborhood and build uh, low energy buildings there? Should we improve the facade or should we just leave it as this? So what you see always in the bottom right hand of each of these images is over 50 years the kilowatt hours per square meter used. So the highest is of course if we wouldn't do anything then we get a really high number corresponding to a high energy use. If you go to the bottom right, you see what would happen if we would basically bulldoze all the buildings and build low energy buildings. That's also a pretty high number. So actually the best one is the top right, which means that we are redoing the facade. And this basically just shows you that obviously the energy embodied in buildings is so high that we can't afford just to not work with our existing structure. So that just gives you more of an argument for how to do this. Um, since we are mainly focused traditionally on uh, daylight simulations, we have a daylighting module as well that can, within half an hour, basically calculate you the annual daylight availability uh, in a whole neighborhood very effectively. So that we are using daylight at the neighborhood scale basically as an access point to light and health and just uh, a quality of living in a space. And if you can model the daylight in the buildings, you can also, of course, model the daylight outside of buildings. So you can do auto thermal comfort analysis, combine median radiant temperatures calculation with short wave and radiation uh, simulations uh, in order to get a sense where outside between buildings um, it's going to be comfortable. And once you start with that, then of course you realize, well, when I want to model a city, I have not only control about the buildings, but everything in between. So how, what can we do there? So this is some work that we did with uh, Martha Gonzalez, who is a perfect professor in civil engineering at MIT. Effectively, we're using uh, travel data, in this case for Boston, 65,000 travel points, travel diaries, and we cluster them into typical behavior. So, if you take the whole of Boston, you have the stay home person, the worker, the adventurer, and the student. And by doing something of this, the fun part is when you build a new building, you can decide what kind of population you cater you and their behavior you stuff in that building. And so then you can basically predict what kind of trips people are going to take and so forth. And that gives you now you know, the outside conditions with, uh, between the buildings. You know when people go on trips. So now you can start to get, make them walk or bike. So in order to do this, we want to know when do people walk or bike. So this is some data that we collected with Hubway, which is our local bike sharing program, where you see on the left-hand side what is the temperature conditions in Boston when people bike. And to my shame, the hardy Bostonians, I have to admit, they only bike between when it's 60 and 80 degree Fahrenheit. There. <laughs> which is, of course, because they have a choice. When you're using Hubway, that's not the only thing you can do. And when it comes to rain, that's uh, Particularly interesting, so if there is zero rain, then people bike, and as if there's a little drop, then people uh, temper off biking. And that's, of course, very useful for us, because we know when the trips are, we know what the outside conditions is, we can start predicting, basically, what has to be done to get people uh, using, non, uh, using human power transportations. So all of this different interrelated an analysis schemas for a neighborhood really should lead into something that we call our scorecard where you basically look at a neighborhood and say, what's my de density, what's my cash flow, um, what's the energy use, access to daylight, or so forth. And just to get you an idea, we just have a new website up, which we call the, uh, the Umiverse, where you see all our past projects. And uh, this is one that I, I show you just two projects. This is one that I really like. This is um, an analysis of Central Square in Cambridge, which is an area directly between MIT and Harvard which has pretty low density right now, only 1.5, but it's expected that it will experience rapid urban growth. So the K2C2 proposal in the middle was the proposal from the city, and our proposal was basically uh, seeing what else we could do there. So what you see here, the city wanted to triple the density, but um, what that effectively does in that neighborhood, it kills access to daylight to all the buildings. 
the way the streets are, they're very narrow. You kill outdoor comfort. You don't get access to daylight anymore. So we said rather, if we just double the density and use micro units, which fit anyhow with the type of people that are going to live there, then you can still, you get actually higher cash flows back. Um, you get better energy and daylighting use. So the idea is not necessarily that each of these results are absolutely correct, but they show you trends, and that's really what it's about. So when you look at various ideas for a neighborhood, you, you can see what are the pros and cons, and you get some quantitative assessment of what that is. And I'm gonna skip that just in the interest of time. This is a project that I wanted to show you, uh, which is called uh, MIT Net Zero Growth. And I wanted to show it because uh, you're a university campus as well. So how do you do long-term energy usage planning for buildings? And in the case of MIT, we know we're gonna uh, rapidly expand in the Kendall Square area. MIT just announced eight major new buildings that are being built there. So how do we put that in context with overall carbon emissions of the university? So we try to use UMI to basically say how much savings uh, can we generate in the existing buildings to buy us a carbon budget to build new buildings. And in order to build, a, to model a whole campus, what we did is we started with our, we have 160 buildings. We picked a few of them, the Media Lab, the Dreyfus Building, Sloan School, and Massey Hall, which is a dome. And then we went into each of these buildings and effectively, here you see for Sloan School, tinkered with all the simulation inputs until we get pretty, got pretty close to the measured results. And the main point of these templates uh, that we had camped them is that we applied them to a whole campus. So then we now have a campus model uh, for all 160 buildings, which didn't take forever to generate. And what can you do with this kind of thing? Well, one is, of course, you can say, well, what's climate change going to do? So in our field, there's a tool that allows you to use IPCC scenarios, apply them to uh, climate files, and basically turn the clock forward. So if we do that for our campus, what you're seeing is uh, pretty um, increased dramatically increased cooling load, some reduced heating uh, use on the campus due to a warming climate and related to their changes in electricity. And that effectively helps us to, we know that if we don't do anything to our campus in the next 50 years, we'll just use four or five percent more energy just due to climate change. So this is a barrier that we have to overcome by itself. Uh, we then just looked uh, at various efficiency measures that we could face in uh, in on our campus, and it shows that really it doesn't do a lot of changes. So if in a big institution like ours, we really want to save energy use, we have to look at the labs and the amount of energy that's used in the labs and how we get that down. The buildings play, in a way, a secondary order in this context. So some closing thoughts. I just wanted to show you that uh, fields such as building performance simulation are diffusing away just from the traditional load calculation into decision making uh, processes at the urban and at the building level, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing if we properly educate everybody as what the limitations of these tools are. And my prediction is that in the next five uh, years, we will see these applications nearly ubiquitous. Right now, we have a new project with Boston where we work with the GIS department where we are exporting 130,000 building energy model out of the GIS model of Boston and then feed it back into their model, and that's something that the city's gonna maintain by themselves. So we are really at a point where we don't need the energy consultants anymore. We can do some of the analysis just within the GIS departments within cities. And that's, of course, it's gonna mean that we have completely different ways of looking at our future, developing resiliency and sustainability plans and so forth. So the roles for architects and planners I really see is that they can help develop good metrics because I think we leave that too much to Ashway and the engineers. <laughs> no uh, pun intended. If you design a building, you understand best what kind of quality you are looking for in a building. And now that you have the tools available to predict the performance of a building, I think you should really temper with them. It's very fruitful to look at, come up with metrics, try them on your building, and see if you like the building. And if you don't like the building, then change the metric. I think that doesn't happen enough. I think nobody has really looked for look, uh, changing from lead one to lead two to lead three, how the buildings change that get this credit. Just somebody like me maybe thought that was a good idea to use daylight autonomy, but nobody looks at how the buildings change. And I think that's incredibly important, and there's nobody better than, than the architects, obviously, and the urban planners to do that. 
With that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, since uh, Rob already mentioned this, I have a book. I'm on a book tour. I'm going to New York tomorrow. If you want to buy a copy, go online or I pay the, I sell them for you half price here as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
they can do that fine. They don't need the engineers, uh, especially if they're at MIT. No, uh, but we are at the same time, we have the building technology program. So we have a combination of both. And I would say it's very helpful, of course. Yeah, I think it's not so much a matter of background, but having enough people in a school that know the tools. And there we are, of course, blessed because we develop a lot of the tools ourselves. So uh, it's very important for me that uh, most of the members in my group have an architectural background because I want them to be able to talk with designers, so it's a very fluent discussion, and a lot of them use the tools in various design competitions as well. So I guess that's the route that we are picking. I think it's very good to combine engineers and architects. The earlier, the better to uh, get beyond the, uh, the cultural divide that is, I think, arti artificially introduced later. Thank you. <laughs>